wonder if that's going to be too loud or too quiet. We shall see how loud my voice is. Okay. Oh, that might be loud. Let's turn that down. Now, what number was there that I just erased? Is that a three that's supposed to go there? These numbers just keep going up, don't they? What is it, the 20th, I think, today? I'm eager, so eager to erase the number, I forget what one to write there. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to my studio. My name is Michael Markowski. And I'm so excited for you guys to be here t so that you can join me on another painting session. We are going to paint another painting by another one of my very favorite artists. Wu Guangzhong is probably the most famous contemporary Chinese painter. Um, he died about 10 years ago, but... Um, certainly towards the end of his life, and I would say from maybe the 1980s, 90s, until 2010, I believe, when he died, he was kind of the, the titan of the Chinese art world. He is not as well known here in North America, as certainly as much as he should be, um, considering the influence and the popularity that he has back in his home country in China. So uh, I'm super excited to do um, uh, a painting, maybe two, depending on, on how quickly we work here, because one of the features of his, his whole painting process and... Um, of of his his artwork is a certain a certain amount of speed um and less of a fixation on details which you know considering the paintings that we've just made um or especially if we go back to yayoi kasuma uh that was all about the details right anyone who was doing all those little dots with me hour after hour you know what i'm talking about um now having said that it uh, just because uh, Wu Guangzhong painted but quickly, it doesn't necessarily mean that the entire painting was executed you know, in a matter of minutes. So sometimes artists paint quickly, but the painting takes a while to finish because sometimes those brushstrokes are highly considered. So we'll talk about all of this as we get going here. So... Um, where, which, what do I want to show? Let's show, here's just, uh, here's his Wikipedia page. We'll get into his biography in a moment here. Um, but what I do want to show right off the top, oh, I've got a lot of files in here, don't I? Um, ooh, I forgot to open all of these. Let's see if this opens as one. Um, I want to show you the the images or the the first one that we're going to do, and then okay, come on. Okay, here we are. Um, so I want to show you these and how you can get these images. So that if you want to download them, you can kind of do that while I kind of get uh, get the ball rolling here. So on the screen, you're going to see a painting that he made. What's going on here? Come on. <laughs> there we go. So this is the painting that's in the thumbnail. This is his his great the Great Wall, um, and uh, just as a little bit of a heads up, which one of the things that I I often do with these artworks is I enlarge them and extend them so that they fit on an eight and a half by eleven sized canvas or nine by twelve, which is the size that I paint on. Um, let me see, was it? So this is a little bit closer to what the actual original format of this painting is. In fact, it might even have been a little bit more compressed down, but I can't quite remember. But I have 
added a little bit of extra stuff down here using some of the tools in Photoshop and added a little bit more space into the sky. But anyway, if you're interested in working on this image, I have included a printout, which, um, you know, I haven't actually done the printout because I think what I am going to do today, which is a little bit different than many of the things that we've done in the past, is I'm going to try to to improvise a little bit of this on my own. Now, if you've already gone ahead and printed it out and sketched it out onto a piece of paper, fantastic job. There's, um, you can use those guidelines to do what we're going to do today. But if you want to get like a super accurate version of uh, Wu Guangzhong's painting, here's here is your cheat sheet basically, right? There is a few other files in this Dropbox folder, which I'll show you the location of in just a second. There's an here's another painting of his. Um, this one here is viewing fish at Flower Harbor, and with many of these paintings, I. I, I don't know for sure, but I suspect many of the paintings that that we're looking at were actually done on location in real time. That's one of the the features of his art is he uh, often painted live and in person. He did painting demonstrations. Or if There's a few videos that I've linked. Actually, I'll show, uh, show them here in a second, but not the actual video themselves, but... Uh, um, where you see him with a crowd of people painting, you know, in in harbors and on buildings, in buildings. So it wouldn't have surprised me if he was standing there and made this entire painting, um, or at least a sketch of it before he painted it. Anyway, there's a tracing of it as well, if you want to do that. And then here's another painting. Again, I don't, I don't think we're going to get all of these done today, um, but... If you're if you find any one of these more appealing than others, I'll show you the technique and then you can do with it what you will. So here is uh, this painting here, House by the Waterfall from 1994. And then here's my outline version of that as well. Okay. So here's let's let's um I'm gonna show you the Dropbox folder here. So if you click on a link in the video description below, you'll see a Dropbox folder. And in that Dropbox folder, it shows you all of these other paintings that uh, we have done. We've done all the way up to here, Wu Guangzhong. And then you can see also the names of artists that are coming down the pipeline as we go forward here. Uh, obviously, there's no files in any of these folders because I'm still working on all of them. But uh, if we click on here, you will see all these here. You'll see two versions of each tracing. One's a JPEG and a PDF. They are all identical. So there is uh, ultimately three paintings and th three files for each painting, making nine files. <laughs> you can see I, I went into art, not mathematics, right? Okay. Um, after you're all done your, your painting, I encourage you to upload it to our private Facebook group. Um, this is a great community of people just like yourself. If you're watching me right now, you want to be involved with a great group of artists, um, people at all different stages of development, um, some at the very, very beginning, and then some people who are, are really far along that uh, are, are making artwork and selling artwork. And uh, so it's really cool to be a part of that group and to see the versions that dozens of other people make for each of our, the, the paintings that, that we do here. Um, I'll get into, I think I'll talk a little bit about his biography as we start painting here, but this gives us, a, I just want to show a little bit of a kind of a quick sneak and peek at his art. And if you look here, you, you probably see some commonalities. Uh, there's obviously the black ink that he's using. A lot of these paintings are done on paper. Now, of course, we're not painting on paper. We're going to use a canvas, um, but the technique will be relatively the same. We won't get quite the same effect and the same kind of bleed um, that is a feature of his art, but we can kind of fake it out a little bit. So you can see that there's also this, uh, a lot of exposed uh, paper that he is a big feature of his art, right? We see a lot of the actual color of the paper 
kind of bleeding through or uncovered, I guess you, you might say. Um, so, and then there's also just these like sprinkles of color. Like, so for instance here, like he paints this street and we have, he didn't color everything, didn't do the sky. He's sort of selecting certain areas of color that he wants to draw our attention to. And I think that is really, really interesting. There's a, a lightness and an airiness to his work, which is a feature really of, of a lot of Chinese art going back, you know, a couple thousand years, right? That um, uh, this, this tendency to leave empty space in the work is, um, is something that artists from China have been doing, as I said, for a couple thousand years, and really f trying to draw our attention to certain things, which is very, comp like 180 different than most artists in the Western tradition have done, right? If we were to look at, you know, you, you could pull a name out of a hat of tens of thousands of different Western artists going back a couple thousand years, and you'd have a hard time finding an artist who would leave the sky blank, right? Um, who would only put a certain amount of colors in a certain few places here. Um, but you would have a hard time finding Chinese artists out of the millions of Chinese artists that have existed over the millennia who have not left ample spaces blank, right? So I think that's kind of just, um, and I guess the other thing too, when I think about his art is just the, is the actual choice of color. Um, some of like these colors, especially these greens and the yellows, pinks and purples are, are a common palette in a lot of his work. Um, a lot of his work from the seventies and eighties and nineties, um, towards the end of his life for particular reasons, which we will get into because a lot of his early artwork no longer exists. Um, I think here's just a few more links if people want to read a little bit about him. These are in the video description below. You see, here's him sketching uh, on location, um, which is a little bit of a Western influence as far as in my very limited understanding of Chinese art. It's it was less common for artists to do plein air painting or painting outside in the plain air, as you know, made famous by Van Gogh and the Impressionists. That is, um, you know, and and really they were also breaking with a Western tradition as well, right? Most artists would work in a studio in a place that was covered and both in east and west um, traditions artists did that just because going back 200 years and more or really 150 years in the past most art materials were really unstable and you needed a bench and a table to grind and mix things it wasn't really until the tubes of oil paint were compressed into tubes in the mid 1800s that artists could go outside and paint in public. You know, artists were sketching in public, but drawing is a different thing than painting, right? This is the painting itself. Here it was auctioned by Sotheby's. So if you want to look at the actual painting, zoom right on in on it. Um, and you can see, I, I'm not exactly sure how much, I think this, this would be what, 15, million Hong Kong dollars, I think would be, is somewhere around like a, like four or five million. In fact, let's just, let's see if we can just dig this up. Uh, so yeah, what two million dollars, which, you know, is a pretty good deal if, uh, considering how important he is to the history of Chinese art. I think it's, that would be, if you had a couple, if, if I had a couple of million dollars to spare, I'd, I'd blow it on, on a bunch of paintings by Wu Guangzhou <laughs> and I'd make a killing. Um, here's wiki art. There's hundreds of his, here's a little, some more colorful works of his, maybe a little bit more dense in terms of, uh, material. I'm not going to play these videos, but you can watch, um, this one's by Sotheby's promoting a sale of his work. And this is a video that was made shortly after he died. 
um, kind of just talking about his life. A great video. Um, uh, and, you know, there's some footage of him actually talking. I, I just get the feeling that he was a, a pretty happy individual, uh, considering some of the things he, he had to deal with throughout his life. And he seems like a pretty outgoing fun guy to be around quite frankly like I, he, I would imagine that he would be an easy to get along with kind of fellow uh, okay so let's let's dive into this painting and um, and let's start getting some colors out so I've got my canvas here here, let's go to this view. Okay, so I've got a canvas, which, um, again, you could do this with paper if you wanted. If you were to do it with paper, you would, you would then really have the option of using inks to, or watercolors or anything like that would work really well. So let's give this a quick sand. Deborah would love to do the house by the water. Okay. Well, we'll see. Um, we'll see how, how much we can get done here. So I'm going to sketch this out very lightly, just so I have... Because I'll show you kind of how I would approach this painting. Um, uh, not necessarily if I was the artist himself, but in order to, to recreate this image with as much of the kind of feeling that he he had here. So one of the things I would just kind of start is just very... Actually, I'm just going to draw this... I'm going to draw this a little bit darker than um, than I probably would. I, I would do this much lighter. But... Um, let's say I put this... wall going across here. Now, I don't think he would have done any pencil lines like this at all. Um, I think he just went and started painting, and there's a few short clips of him painting on the web. Um, but uh, there is limited... Um, uh, you, you don't really see up close as to what he's drawing. Really what I'm just doing here is just trying to lay some very simple lines to show me where some of the composition might be. And I can always move these things, or these lines around. I guess I'm... I, I apologize if they're not if it's harder to see these lines but I'm just I just want to get the the basics in place and I think that that's gonna make me more than happy okay again if you've if you took the uh, actual sketch and you've traced it out then you've already got a lot of these lines on here and then you can um, use those lines to help you uh, if and I should also mention if you wanted to transfer those lines onto canvas the way that you would do it is you could just print out any of those documents that are on the um the uh, the dropbox in fact maybe i will print out one of them maybe we'll see if i can get the the house done maybe i'll print that one out so you could see how i would do one and or the other right so i'd use gra uh, carbon paper graphite paper and transfer onto the canvas so Let's get our art materials out here. One of the things that uh, Wu Guangzhong used to paint is is you use uh, kind of traditional materials, which would include like Chinese ink, um, which is it's not watercolor, but it is for. For most people, you would you could use that to to get a very similar effect. Um, 
ink is is different than watercolor in that ink comes usually as a fluid, right? So you you could literally pour it right out and, and uh, you'd have a little, in fact, I wonder where this, oh, you know what I see? I haven't used this in forever. Let me see. Okay. <laughs> I got to take my microphone off one second here. Okay, so this is a little um, painting uh, tray that my father got for me. I've had this for so long, I can't remember exactly why he got it. for. This might have been when I graduated high school or college. I'm not sure. Um, but um, uh, this is, you know, a kind of a typical reservoir that you would put ink in. So a couple of one of the the you have a few different kinds of ink you have india ink and japanese sumi ink which are very similar to any kind of chinese ink right um essentially they're just like really really dark dark watery inks as you can hear right it's it's like water and you just pour it in here and then you use a bamboo brush to do most of the painting I didn't even think about, I do have some bamboo brushes, and I started looking like two minutes before we went live and realized I can't find where they are. I need to really clean my studio up, but we will uh, just use the, the basic materials that we've been using for every other painting. Because I really want you to see that you can make pretty much every painting by anyone who ever lived using the basic paints that we've used so far. Right? You don't need to spend a fortune on paint. So let's. Uh, we're going to use some black, obviously. Actually, you know, before I even put more paint on here, what I want to do, I want to put down, I'm going to make a ground. I'm going to paint a color over this whole thing just to simulate a little bit more of uh, the paper look. So, for instance, like this slightly kind of cream color, let's make that, and we're going to put that down to start. So, we're going to put down a little bit of warm yellow. We're going to make a, a brown, basically. We're just going to put a ton of white into it. So we'll just start with this basic set of colors so far. If you're wondering what these colors are, I've, I've kind of talked about this many, many times in the past, but I know many people are, are seeing me for the first time. Um, we, we're we're going to use a warm yellow, a warm red, and a warm blue to get started. And I'm going to use a big brush here. So let's, we're going to use most of this warm yellow. I'm not going to scoop every, all of it up just yet. Let's put a little bit of warm red in here. Notice how I, whenever I'm mixing, I kind of, I'll, I'll put things together in the middle. And then if I need more, I, I pull a little bit of that in here, right? I think that's good for right now, we'll see. We're gonna put a little bit of blue in here now. Okay, so we've got this now kind of a sandy color. And now let's start putting some white in here. And let's look at the screen. That's pretty good. It's a little, it's almost still a little bit too intense. So let's just add more white to this mixture here. It's always easier to darken a color. So if you put too much white in it, you'd only need to put a little bit more of the color 
to get it to go back to its previous um, darker color. Okay, that looks pretty good. It might be a little bit darker, but I don't mind. I think it's going to complement this painting kind of nicely. So what I'm going to do next is I'm just going to take some water. This is the only time I ever use water when I'm painting with acrylic. And just to help thin it out a little bit and make it a little bit more transparent so that um, I can see any of the pencil lines or tracings that I created put down there initially. So, okay, so let's move that out of the way. And then I'm just going to paint this whole thing out. Well, I was going to say, I should prep this other canvas now, but you know what? If I transfer an image on it, I'd prefer to do that on a blank canvas. And as always, I like to get all my edges... So this is this is a little bit more, as I said. I could have probably put a little bit more white on there, but um, I think a little bit more of a creamy color will will actually kind of work nicely. It will complement that black anyway. So yeah, <laughs> it's a little bit a little bit darker than than the original. Um, now my pencil lines have disappeared a bit. Um, but I'm going to bring them back here in a second when I blow dry it. If I decided that this was actually too dark, what I would still do is I would still just blow dry it and then just paint some more white over top of it. I wouldn't be too concerned. So, so, you know, I think I am just going to add a little bit more white in here and, and basically sort of do this again, right? So, let's put a little bit more white in here. Get a little bit more water to thin this down. I was just sort of, as it dried, I was like, you know what, that is really dark. So let's, this might mean I lose a little bit of my pencil lines, but... I just want to really mix this in. I still want to get this color in here. That's a little bit better. It looks pretty white on camera. Let me 
you'll just be like, oh, well, this is painted. It might as well paint it white. But it will, like, I'll hold a piece of white paper up afterwards, and you'll see it's, it's certainly not all that white. Now, again, I've lost my pencil lines. But I don't mind. I actually think that this looks kind of nice because now it's got a little bit of, it's not just that color, it's almost glowing a bit. Which if you've watched any of these other previous episodes, even specifically the one we just did a couple days ago, the Yoshitomo Nara painting, we saw how effective another color underneath, in that case like a bright magenta, can have on a painting. Um, okay. So I can see a little bit of the pencil lines. It probably doesn't show up on camera. Um, but I would I would say that that also kind of fits pretty well with his overall philosophy on painting. And I don't think he was at, in any way whatsoever concerned with quote unquote perfection. I, I don't, I, I just think he just, because it's not, I don't think that's a, 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 a feature. Well, you know, this, this is, it's an interesting philosophical thing because I don't think most Asian artists, you know, Japanese, Korean, Chinese artists, um, were, are, obsessed with doing things perfectly um but it doesn't mean they're sloppy or lazy it's just that they're they're really open to embracing uh the the the, the spontaneous quality that sometimes happens in a painting where it doesn't turn out the way that you quote unquote want I think that they're really open to just letting the painting develop on its own. You know, artists often talk about their paintings as, as kind of being like a living organism. And I think probably more so than, than most of the other uh, cultures that we've talked about so far. I think the Asian artists are, are those that are, are, are that are really most open to embracing the unexpected chance occurrences and um, are less likely to look at a quote-unquote mistake or something that doesn't go according to plan as being wrong or failure or as a mistake, right? So now we've got uh, our canvas prepared. Remember, I said I was going to show you. Um, oh, you know what? I, I did print these out. I, I was like, okay, <laughs> okay. So I here here is my printouts. I remember I did this like weeks ago. So this would be the printout. So you can see how much different the, the my background color is from white, right? Because if you look at it like, oh, this is like a white canvas. You just painted it back to the way it was before. But when you hold a piece of paper up to it, you're like, oh, wow, actually, yeah, that is very, very different. Um, and then so here's the printouts for the other one. There's the, the house by the hill and the waterfall. And then this is the um, fish pond. Um, so, um, again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just sort of, quote-unquote, freehand this on here. Because I think that might just be 
it might be just a good little change for some people um, and also just like kind of liberating so the way that I think I'm gonna do this especially now that I've got this thing out. I didn't plan on using it but um, this is gonna be you know I'm gonna use I will use that in a second but I think it, just for so people can see what I'm doing because it could be a little unclear what I want to do, and you, I'm going to use a little bit of my of sl, of a pouring medium. Now we haven't used pouring medium in a while. The last time we used pouring medium was when we did the Helen Frankenthaler episode as part of the How to Paint course, right? And if you want to watch that episode or do the whole course, there's a link to that in below. I think it's called the Intro to Painting Course, 45 episodes. Um, so. I'm going to put a little bit of this, I'm going to mix it into my black paint so that I can get a little bit more of a flowy, watery kind of uh, texture when I'm painting here. Whoa. Okay. So, if you don't have this medium, you could use water. It, um, Water will behave a little bit different than this. Obviously, we're we're putting a a, a, a a chemical medium in it, an acrylic medium, so it's going to be different than water because water is just is just water. Right? There's nothing, no chemicals or anything in it. Um, the, the pouring medium is used for you may have heard like pouring. So you've probably seen videos where people are pouring paint onto canvas. Again, we did that. Um, in that course. So I just, um, I thought it might be kind of fun to add a little bit of this here. So you can see how much I put in there. Um, and this is going to help give it a real nice watery kind of quality. But without getting too watery. Right, so it's we're, 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 we are thinning the paint out, but one of the great things with using pouring medium is the color stays relatively opaque, right? It's still, like you can see now, even though I've stirred this in and there was like maybe three to one pouring medium to black paint, it's still very, very dark, right? Darker even than, you know, if we add um, glazing fluid, Right? If we did the same thing and I added a lot more glazing fluid, this would become much more transparent. Now, it is hard, it's harder to really see this effect when we use black, because black is such a dominant color and will make things go really dark anyway, but this is just a way that we can use now to, to, to paint a little bit more flowing lines. Um, if you wanted to get... In this painting, like the bleed effect happening, we could add a, even a little bit of water to this paint to try to get a little bit of that. So maybe we'll, we'll, we'll kind of do a little bit of both. We'll see how things go. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it bears a, a quick reminder that we are talking about one of the greatest artists who ever lived, right? And I don't consider myself anywhere near the quality of artist as Wu Guangzhong uh, was. Um, I'm I I teach painting and I I make paintings and I sell exhibit paintings, but I'm not, by no means do I consider myself an expert, particularly on the technique that he's using. This is just my my version of it that I think could be fun for for um, people to, to try to play with at home. And, and there are, there's, I should also mention that there are classes probably in your own area where people will teach you the authentic techniques that artists like Wu Guangzhong used um, because he comes from a long tradition of painting. Um, and a lot of, like, you know, some say, basically all Chinese painters are calligraphers at heart, right? And so, in a way, the, the painting process is a lot like painting calligraphy, right? Okay, so let's, let's, um, in fact, my, the, remember that pencil drawing I drew on there? It's pr 
pretty much gone. And I can see little fragments of it. I don't even, it doesn't seem to appear on canvas. But you know what? I am just going to move ahead anyway. So I'm going to, let's just clean this brush I used to mix paint off and put it right in the water so it doesn't harden up on me. And I'm going to get my brush here and soak in some paint. And I'm going to do some of the larger brush strokes just to get started here. And the way that I'm going to do this is I'm going to hold my paintbrush a little bit further away, right? So, you know, in some of the paintings we've been doing, I've, I've choked up on the brush, to use like a baseball term, pretty close, right? For doing really tiny details. And I might do that for some parts of today's painting. But one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to move my hand right back to the side. And so, and so this is also for some people who wonder like why why are paintbrushes really that long right like um uh i don't know if you can see it back there but there's all i have a whole tin or about like three big cups full of big brushes and some of those brushes are you know i don't know maybe two 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 feet long right like why would somebody want a paintbrush that long well there's times where you know, I'm sure that Wu Guangzhong would have used a, a long paintbrush at, at times, especially because some of these paintings are, are 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 larger. You know, they're they're maybe like three by four feet um, large pieces of paper. So he would be working with a larger paintbrush. There's some video where you see him with this like really actually quite thick brush that is. Um, you know, I'd say almost as kind of like as thick as this Sharpie marker, right? And it's it's like a big stick, and with a big um, uh, uh, brush or hairs at the very end of the brush. Anyway, so I'll get my brush into the um, the paint there, my pouring medium, and let's look at the painting again. And especially you know this can be kind of intimidating for some people i totally get it that's why you can use the tracing but what i'm going to do is i want to try to like imagine my brush going for a little walk across the canvas and he probably did you know i don't know how quickly he painted it but just imagine kind of following that pathway and even if you've if you did the tracing Right, just hover your your brush right over it, or if it's easier, you could take your finger and trace the line. Again, you could draw the the pencil line on there if that if that alleviates some anxiety you might feel by doing this kind of thing. But once we've got it kind of that this path figured out, All right, we just put that mark down. Now, you know, there's parts of it that have kind of fallen apart a little bit. You know, places that were thicker and thinner. That's kind of the way the cookie crumbles a bit sometimes, right? If you wanted, you could go and add, go over that mark again. All right, let's do another one. Actually, you know what? He, this is a little thicker here. And it's a little thicker here, too. Okay. So let's keep on going. So, and if, if, um, what it looks like to me is that this is the Great Wall of China right here. And then there's, you know, like a little sentry post right up top there on the top of the horizon. And that one I did without even kind of practicing, um, which I, you know, <laughs> I should have I should have done. But or but you don't have to even either, right? You could just go with it and have a little bit of fun, and and don't worry about making it perfect. Now, obviously, this area kind of bleeds out. I think I'm going to save that for a few minutes. 
And then I'm going to add some water and maybe even a little bit of white to make a gray. And then we're going to see if we can get a little bit more of a watery kind of effect happening here. So while I've still got this dark black here, let me see if there's anything else. You know, I'm going to go to a smaller brush. Now, he would have probably used only one or two brushes to do this and probably would have had a nice big, you know, as I said, that big wide brush that he was using. Um, he could have done that whole painting with it. Now, I don't have one of available like that so actually I am gonna take a smaller brush now the thing with a small brush like this is that I'm only gonna be able to go a little bit before it runs out of paint um, Chinese and Japanese artists and calligraphers often use these um, uh, bamboo brushes that have like long like you know the, this might be the wooden part of the brush but the actual hairs could extend quite far, right? So they can soak up lots of ink and you could do really tiny thin marks for minutes before you have to dip your paintbrush back into the, um, the ink. So let's look at, find another place where we can do this. So I've got a few little lines coming off here. You know, it's kind of, I'm surprised I was actually able to get that far with this line. Um, let's see. That one's a little bit off the mark, but Okay, and then let's put okay. So I'm not exactly sure what some of these other lines are. They could be other parts of the wall extending. Like, so it's, I'm not sure how he, you know, he could be you know, like unfolding the space and flattening it out so that we could see the, the wall coming and then kind of disappearing as it winds around. Um, or they could be parts of the landscape. Uh, they could be other trails alongside the wall. I'm not sure. Um, let's see. Okay. And then I'm going to get these mountains up here. You know, you can see that I'm kind of moving around. One of the things that I'm doing is I'm just sort of putting basic little um, points to help me kind of lock the composition into place. And then I'll slowly get more and more refined with details as we go here. Right, so maybe if I, I also, if I want to get a nice sharp point, one of the things that I do 
is just take my brush and kind of spin it so I can get a little bit more of a pointy mark here. And you know, let's I'm gonna zoom in so that you can see, and let's zoom in on So now I'm, I'm going to get a little bit closer, just so I can get this line here. Okay. And, okay, I think what I want to do before I start putting more black lines in is I'm going to mix a bit of a gray, and I think I'm going to add a lot of, I'm going to add some, well, let's see if I just add water to it, what the effect is. So, I've got this color here. Let's take... Just make sure I do this not on top of my painting. <laughs> Generally, I would do this in like a cup rather than just like this. But let's take, I'm going to scoop out some of this paint here and dissolve it a bit in water here. So now things are pretty watery. And I think maybe I might even just dump this into my the, the brush cup that my father got me since it seems. So I'm just going to do this over the edge. Um, it would be kind of nice to be able to see that, wouldn't it? Let's see. So you can see me spill it all over the place. Will any of it go in there? Oh, look at that. <laughs> uh, so Lin Ying, or so Ling Li from, says, hi from Holland. There are a lot of lines in this painting, <laughs> yes. Um, but don't let that intimidate you. Just because there's a lot of lines in there doesn't mean that it's, it's, it's really too difficult to do, right? We could take our time. There's, um, and you don't have to put all of the lines into the painting. So I, I have a feeling this is going to be a little bit too watery, but hey, the only way for us to know for sure is to, is to try it, right? So there's um, probably about a spoonful, a tablespoon or, of paint on there. Uh, or water, sorry, that I mixed in. In fact, I'm just going to take a little bit more paint and dump this into here. So this is like a pretty watery mixture. Okay, so let's uh, let's go back to here, and where should we? Let's actually let's stay zoomed out. Let's zoom back out. Okay, so I'm going to try uh, these in the background, these little hills. All right, so actually that replicates a lot of like how, it's almost like I'm staining the canvas here. And especially if I if other colors were to be introduced here, they would kind of have a similar kind of, they would start to bleed into one another. So let's go in here 
and do that here as well. I might have to do this a few times. I could use a larger brush, obviously. In fact, I should have, but... One thing that's kind of nice with a th kind of a thick, or when I, I've got the sorry thin paint, is even though there were those brush lines, they kind of are fading out a little bit as they start to dry. Okay, I left this area. And what's kind of, you'll, you'll see that it'll kind of puddle in certain places and leave some darker spots in places, which can be very annoying to some people. Um, but I think if we kind of think about like the, the history of um, this material, is that that was, the, you know, that's actually something kind of prized by these artists. Because it's... It kind of makes things exciting when you don't know um, how it's going to necessarily turn out. Okay, where else can we put some lines? This needs to be bigger here, doesn't it? Well, let's just make it bigger. And maybe this needs to be bigger too, so let's just make it bigger. And rather than, you know, darkening it, the paint, if it's kind of thin enough, we can just do as many layers on here as you want in order to darken it. So this bit of a, a grayer paint is kind of perfect for doing things that might be a little bit further off into the distance. Man, this is, <laughs> considering how complex some of the paintings we've done over the past while have been, this is so refreshing, so liberating. Maybe I'll just show you, um, I have the... The, the actual image on the computer screen right next to me. So I'll, I'll just show you kind of how I'm doing this painting because it might also be helpful for you to see how I'm doing this. Because this would also kind of be similar to how he was painting. Uh, he might be looking at the mountains 
and just sort of painting kind of small brush strokes or, or larger ones without necessarily looking always at the canvas. Now this is a little bit harder for some people to do, I totally understand it, in which case feel free to make small marks, you know, and then look at, look at the image, do a small mark, and then, and then move forward. But um, if you're feeling a little bit more adventurous, you could do something like this. Let's say, let's look for another part of this canvas. So there's this, um, I'll just kind of show you on the screen what I'm looking at. I'm gonna just get this little mark in here, maybe a few little marks in and around this area of the canvas, right? So this is, just so you see, what I'm going to do, I'm going to look here. This is where I'm looking with my eyes. Let's move that out of the way. And all right, so I kind of like looking and then putting a, a small mark down. And I look at it and go like, hmm, was that exactly what I wanted? Maybe not, but then I can just go and touch it up. Right, and let's say where's another little area on here I could show that. Um, I think there's a spot right here. And I just kind of practice that mark. Right, and I actually went over where I wanted to be. I'll just show you where where I was. Just right in here. I was hoping this would kind of come <laughs> like here, but I went over top of that line. Now, you know, when you look at it here, it's like, oh, on its own, it. I wanted this to go in here, but because I wasn't looking at the canvas, it didn't go in the exact right place. But considering this kind of web of lines, it's you know it's one small line out of many, and is it worth you know is it a catastrophic mess? I don't think so, not at all. But uh, I could see why some people might get worked up over stuff like that. Um, let's see. I think we want to do a few small lines in the bottom right corner. So I'm gonna work down here. And again, I'll show you um, how I'd approach that. All right, so I'm just, this is kind of like if you were painting outside in, in real life, um, you you want to be looking at the, 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 the forest, the great wall, a person's face, etc. more than you're looking at your at your canvas or your paper. right? All of the, all of the secrets, all of the clues, all of the information that you need is right there in front of you, right? It's not here. This is the, one of the analogies that I make when I'm when I'm talking about painting and drawing is often that if you're trying to draw something that looks like something like an apple in your hand, right? You want to be looking at that apple more than your hand drawing or painting on the canvas, right? I I, I think of it as like draw like driving, in that you want to be looking out the front of your windshield more than in the rearview mirror. Right. If you were, and and the review mirror would be, let's say, your hand on the on the paper, and the apple would be the road out in front of you. Right. So, if you're driving and you're looking at the road in front of you, right, it's a, you you. That's a pretty safe way of driving. That's the recommended way of driving. However, um, that's not how everybody draws or paints. Most people sit there drawing looking in the review mirror, looking at their hand really carefully. And then they, they, then they look at the apple or whatever, like, well, why does my apple, like my painting in the apple not look like the apple? I don't understand, right? I was so focused on this painting. It's like, just sort of think about that. Oh, well, 
I was stopped really looking at the apple and just started painting an apple for my imagination. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with using your imagination to make an artwork. But if you're wondering why the apple looks doesn't look like the actual apple in your hand or whatever, it's because you you're you're not really looking at it very carefully. Right? So you want to be absorbing, in fact, Let's just, while we're while it's on top of my mind, I'm not going to play this clip. But here, here's this is uh, Wu Guangzhong talking, and I'm not going to play the clip. But you know, he says in sketching from life, what is important is life, <laughs> right? Look at the thing, absorb the life that's in front of you, not you know the some imaginary thing that you're trying. Otherwise, you could be the great imaginative artwork, and there's nothing wrong with that. But it's going to be different than maybe what you expect or what you want it to be. Okay. Let's do a few more of these gray lines. And then I'm going to go back to maybe putting some darker paint on here. And this kind of thing would be really fun for me to see what other people created because um, if everyone is using like this type of approach, you know, people are going to have very different paintings because people would have interpreted it very differently. And I think that would be really, really exciting to see. see some comments in the chat I haven't I won't have a chance to get to it just yet but I see that people are active in there so I'll get to that momentarily okay I think maybe that's good for at this exact moment I'm actually gonna use some even lighter gray or, or essentially just more diluted black here in a minute um, but let's just kind of absorb what we've got, and let me kind of just take a look at the chat here. Uh, Heidi says, Deborah, I also really like the house by the waterfall. I'm just waiting for my cream wash to dry and watching Michael. I have a feeling it would take me a lot of focus to paint this one. <laughs> uh, so Ling Lee says, I don't know that you can so water watery with acrylic, almost watercolor painting. Oh, I didn't know that you can be so watery with acrylic. Okay, yes, okay. So, um, basically, you can do anything you want, right? The thing is, when you, when you add a lot of water to your acrylic, what happens is you're literally breaking down the bonds that hold the pigment together and bind the pigment to the canvas, right? Essentially, acrylic paint is white glue. It's not the same thing, so don't, uh, but, but uh, they are very, very similar, similar materials. In fact, uh, you can use your acrylic paint as, do I, do I have some clear acrylic it's just right there out of reach. Anyway, you can, like, I, I have acrylic medium, which I've you've seen in the past me use um, clear acrylic medium. And that's basically just acrylic paint 
without any color in it, without any powdered pigment mixed into it. And that is very similar to white glue, and you can use it as an adhesive to glue things to the canvas, and I've done that in the past in previous videos. Um, so just think about if you were to take white glue and you were to add 90% water to some white glue and then you were to try to glue some furniture together, right? Uh, might not be the safest chair to sit on or bookshelf to put, you know, your heavy textbooks on because now you've only got 10% glue in that 90% and of and 90% water so you've significantly diluted the adhesive properties of that glue. It'll probably still work for to some extent, but it's certainly not going to be as strong as 100% undiluted white glue, right? Or carpenter's glue. So so think about that when you're thinking about adding water to your paint. So if I was to use a ton of water, it's possible that I could use so much water that essentially I take, I d dilute all of the adhesive properties of the paint and I'm only left with powdered pigment. And I could potentially paint and then blow and then the, literally the paint would just sort of blow away like sand um, or salt or sugar on a plate, right? Now, having said all of that, we can also use paint to stain the canvas. That's kind of like what ink does, it's, or watercolor paint, it's staining the paper, right? And the paper soaks up that, you know, it's, it's like if you get a, you drop some ketchup or mustard on your, your shirt, right? If you go and you wash your shirt really quickly, you can kind of get that stain out. But if you let it sit there overnight and you let it sit there for weeks, it's pretty problematic to try to get that stain on your clothes. So we're kind of, you know, when I dilute the acrylic to this extent, I'm essentially staining the surface of the canvas. So um, it's not going to be as effective as it would be if um, uh, I just painted regular paint on here or if I was painting onto paper, but um, it's, it's pretty good. You know, and again, I like, let's see if we zoom in on this. You can see, actually, let's just go right to this view here. You know, I like what happens in these places where it starts to kind of build up. Like I love that, and it's it's also quite frankly a lot similar, very similar to the way to the way that Wu uh, Guangzhong also painted himself, right? Uh, where if we look at this image, all right, you see these the paint kind of spreading out that way. Right, which I think is really beautiful. So, you know, if we want more of that, let's just do that again. All right, we just take more paint. In fact, let's take even more. I'm just going to heap this on here. can kind of spread it around. And what's kind of cool is it's going to do its own thing. It's it's kind of like a living organism. It's going to kind of bleed and you know, and I, I think that's kind of fun is because you're not really sure what you're going to get until it happens. Now, obviously, someone like Wu Guangzhong was a master, an indisputable master. So after 70 years of painting, he had a lot more control over those unexpected um, occurrences than, than I, I have and most people who might be watching me have, right? And that just comes with using the material over and over and over. You get familiar and you can kind of control this thing that otherwise seems, you know, out of control.
Uh, Paula says, Chinese paintings are normally using calligraphy pens and Chinese black inks. Yeah, right? So, um, but if, again, not necessarily always pens, but brushes, calligraphy brushes as well, right? Okay. What should, let's... I'm going to go back into my black here. And let's zoom out a bit. And... Hmm. One thing I forgot with this paint pouring medium is it... Uh, when it dries, it is kind of nasty. It's kind of like if, if I get it on the table here, it can. You really got to scrub to get it off. So, I have to rem remember to not leave my brushes sitting out, right? Like, they get kind of stiff. Okay. Um. Now there's a bunch of little splatters and spots, and I have a, a few solutions to do that. You can also just do little dots like this if you want. You can have a lot more control if you do it like that. I think I'm gonna try doing even more brushwork with just a, like, holding my paintbrush much further away and really sort of letting it kind of just dance around on the surface of the paint of the canvas here. Ah, that's kind of good. Now I can get a little bit more, it's like it does its own thing. Let me, let's, uh, I'm going to back out. Oops, go this way. So you can see what I'm doing here. So you can see I'm, I'm holding my paintbrush at the very tip, right? And when I do this, it's gonna it's gonna be pretty impossible for me to get the line to go exactly where I want it because the paintbrush doesn't really want to behave, right? So it's tricky, but it also is a great experience of like having to do a little bit of letting go. Right. And if anything, now I'm like doing this is actually getting me closer to the brush strokes that I see on the painting. 
Like there's almost no way to do this by trying to be really calculated and to try to kind of control the brush. You have to let it go. It's so all these lines that we were just talking about, right? Just let them see if you can just play with the paint a little bit. You know, you have the template if you want to do the, a perfect rendering of it afterwards. You can do that. But for one moment, allow yourself to kind of be, give up control over the paintbrush. Here's the painting again, so you just see how I'm painting. And you can really, f like, as I'm doing this, I, I really f can feel the meditative properties of painting, which I feel is always there for me. But in this instance, I feel very, very present. It's, it's hard to do this without being present. I think I want to put a big blob of, of wet uh, paint here, so let's put that in. Um, a bunch of water on this part right here and then I can look at any of these other things and think hmm do they need more water too yeah why not let's load it up if your paint is sufficiently thin enough then you can do things like this without worrying, you know, it'll be kind of, it'll, it goes on a little bit darker like these do, but then they dry and it gets thinner and thinner. It kind of fades out relatively quickly. Okay, maybe while that's also drying, I'm just going to take some of my, my, my brush with this, the original mixture I made here, the black with the paint pouring medium. I'm just going to go back and maybe I'm going to add a little bit of that into some of these more wet areas and we'll just see how the paint behaves. Uh, 
Might just build up a little bit more. Feel free, like, as you're painting this, and if you're feeling inspired to, to, to make more lines, maybe where there aren't any, just because of the way that you've constructed your painting, put them there. Don't worry about making it exactly like the original. I know for some that's like um, heresy to to take the painting and to kind of play with it like that, but nobody will know except you unless you decide to show it and to other people and and there's probably very few people that are as familiar with this image anyway who will be able to say like oh no you you didn't do it justice cuz you did the blah 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 okay so i'm liking where all this is going i think what i want it to do is did i splatter brush. Ah, I left it over there. Okay. Um, let I'm just going to mute my microphone. I'm going to go get See um, Deborah's comment. Oh, uh, oh there's, well, there's lots of comments here. I didn't see. Okay, so So Ling Lee says, Do you paint only with acrylics? Um, personally, I paint more often with oil paints, or at least I, I used to for about 20 years. I was doing mostly oil paints on um, for my the art that I've exhibited. And, um, although. I've been painting more and more acrylic paintings over, at say, the past four or five years, um, just because, um, uh, partly because I've been teaching it so much that um, it's just easier to kind of, when you're using one medium, to kind of stay in that same sort of mindset. They are very, very similar. Um, and really you know if you get it you can get into whole conversations with other artists about like um, painting with oil versus acrylic and which one's better you know honestly at least I I know I know methods that I can use to make oil paints look like acrylic paints and I can use you know techniques and materials to make acrylic paints look like oil paints and I can fool anybody so I, when I first started um, learning about uh, uh, or you know the, the using both of those I because I learned in acrylic in art school often you begin with acrylic paints and then you might take some oil painting classes and, and which is what I did um, and then after I graduated, I, I painted almost exclusively in oil paints for about 20 years. Um, and you'll he often hear people that there's like a look to acrylic paint, which there can be if you don't really know necessarily what you're doing and you're using it right out of the tube. It can look a little bit plasticky, which is not surprising because acrylic paint is plastic. It literally is plastic, right? It's a, if you've acrylic is a plastic, <laughs> I don't know any, right? So that's why it can look a little bit plasticky, like a like a, a, a plastic toy or something, right? Or plastic saran wrap. It has a particular kind of shine to it. Um, but you can get rid of that shine if you like. That's pr one of the reasons why I tend to like more matte paints and matte mediums when I'm painting with acrylic. Okay, anyway, what I want to do now, I, I've got a brush, this like splatter brush which you can use for um, doing a little bit of splattering. 
Um, this kind of a brush, I'm not sure how much. I think I probably paid maybe probably 10 bucks or 5 bucks. I don't know. I tend to just buy lots of art supplies all the time. Um, and this kind of thing is great for, for getting kind of splatters. It works a little bit better than... Um, uh, than any other brush another if you don't have anything like that one thing you can use is a toothbrush right so actually maybe let's just start with a toothbrush so I'm just gonna get my toothbrush in this fluid here and actually maybe before I even do that what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna blow dry this first uh, at least this top half here, because I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, put some paper over it so that if I get any overspray, because in his painting, he doesn't have any overspray up here, so I'm gonna try to limit the amount of spray so it doesn't go into the sky. Although I could easily mix paint and paint over any mis quote unquote mistakes. As I did that, I just realizing this, I'm using the paint pouring medium, which slows down the drying time, so I could be blow drying for a while. So you know what? If I get overspray, we'll just deal with it. So I'm going to take this um, uh, toothbrush, and I want to try to get some splatters. Maybe I'll, I'll use my hand over here. Oh, you see, I just got... If you did get a little bit of overspray, and if you're quick on it, you can get... A little bit of water, and you can do a reasonable job of cleaning it up. But you can also wipe some of the paint off, which I may have done a little bit of. Um, anyway, let's just have a little bit of fun here. I'm less worrying about doing it perfectly. So you see what I'm doing? I'm just taking the the bristles and rubbing my finger back on it to create this spray effect. Now, obviously there was no spray inside here. I'm a little bit leery. If I start kind of wiping this, it'll just gonna make a big mess. So I'll leave it like that, right? It's not exactly like what he did, but there's also a lot of changes that I've made so far. So let's uh, let's actually transition to putting some color in here, and then we'll think we'll we'll start winding this painting down and then move on to another one. So as far as other colors in this painting, there is what looks like to be a magenta red. So I'm going to put some of my cool red onto the palette. Um, and I'm going to put down some cool yellow. And cool blue. And I think that gives me all the colors I need. Okay, and I'll just put this brush into the water to soak for a bit. Put the toothbrush in there. So now you, you see that I, I actually did not use my toothbrush for, for brushing my teeth. I'm using it for painting. <laughs> Since it's been in there for a while, people wondering if I'm sneaking a little toothbrush break in the middle of my painting session. Okay, so the magenta... I'm just going to take this cool magenta and this time, uh, let's just use... I'm going to use a little bit of, of uh, glazing fluid just for fun. 
Oops, looks like it's dried on the top there. So I'm just going to mix some glazing fluid into the paint just to give it a little bit more thinness. We could add a little bit of water to it if you, if that's all you had. A glazing fluid or slow drying medium, just to kind of um, give it a little bit more transparency because when I look at his painting, that's what I see is a little bit more transparency. some kind of fun about just putting little dots of color like this around. Now again, we can do it like this. Um, or we can use our toothbrush again. So let's, I'm just going to get my toothbrush out. I'm just going to I'm going to clean off because we had all that black paint on there. And I'm going to get some water and rub it into the paint. I need a little bit more water to make it watery enough to splatter. Okay, and then let's do the same thing. Oh, big blob. Now, you know, afterwards, if I wanted, I could actually paint that out, even though it's not what he did. I wonder how he prevented that splatter from going in there. He's the master. Um, he might have put a piece of paper down there to prevent that from happening. I mean, it does look really nice with that nice clear path where, whereas all of this chaos is going on around the sides, right? Um, whereas mine, I've now got a bunch of paint there. So maybe I will. I mean, we'll see. We'll see. Maybe when I'm mixing the paint for the background of the other paintings, I'll do that. Um, so let's just carry on here. I'm going to clean paintbrush off. Let's now get some, I'm going to put a little, a little bit of glazing fluid again for my yellow. And then I'm just going to mix that up. And then I should just put that there. Let's wipe the brush off and I'm going to use the toothbrush just to get water onto the canvas. So got lots of water on there. And let's just do the same thing. A lot more yellow than I think was in his. Although, actually, now that I'm looking at it, I see when it dries, it's going to go, it'll be fairly subtle. So, uh, 
Okay, oh, and some green, right? And to make that green, we're just gonna add a little bit, I'm gonna add a bit of the cool blue. I think he put a little bit of white into this green. I kind of like the green like this, and I think actually because it's diluted, it will go a little bit lighter anyway, so I am just going to keep it like that. I'm going to just get my brush. I think I need a bit more water. Okay. So is it, you know, it's, did the drops go in the exact same place? No. This is certainly a different version of his painting. And I can now take my brush. If I feel like I want to be a little bit more specific, I can just go in here and add paint where I feel it might be helpful. Okay. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to let this dry like this. Because if I start blow drying it, it could blow the the these drips away and we could get some... Um, the drips could spread, which is not... Again, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. Uh, but it's not really what he did. I would suspect, because especially if he's painting on paper, he would just sort of let it sit in the sun, and probably in five minutes it would just be all dry, right? Okay, so let's move this. I need a nice flat place. Okay, so let's make a different painting here. So we'll do, actually, let's wipe this down because I've got a bunch of wet paint splatters everywhere. And I wonder, you know, hmm, which way do I want to do this one? Um. Well, let me, I'm going to sand this first. So I got my canvas. I've, I've, it's, this is a nine by 12 gessoed, pre-gessoed canvas, uh, which I've then put more gesso on. And then I'm going to sand it with 220 grit sandpaper, right? Nice smooth surface. So let's mix up that paint. Or should I should I do that a tracing? How about I'll do a, a little tracing of it, just so anyone watching who wants to know how I do that method, they can see this here too. So this method, I'm going to take some carbon paper. You can get that from. There's a link in the video description for that. And I print out um, print it out that's in the in the Dropbox as I mentioned before. I think I'm going to move it a little further down. Remember how I normally put it right in the middle? I'm going to move mine further down because well, actually, now that I look at the original, interesting. Um, the sky does go pretty close to the very top. Um, you know, it's up to you. I think I'm going to keep, I'm, I am going to, I want to have a little bit of space 
at the top is what I'm going to privilege in my painting. Okay. So I'll just put that there. I'm going to use this. And I'm just going to do very simple tracing. Okay. So the outline that I have here, right, again, it's in the Dropbox. I just want to trace the very loose outlines of this composition. Really, probably the main things that I would focus on is just this architecture down here. And, you know, where the, the water meets here. Um, the shoreline. lines going up here so I mean the benefit of doing this method is that I have I'll be closer to the original um, so that I'll have that satisfaction of making a painting that looks more like the original the trade-off is you, you can take some of the spontaneity out of this particular kind of method of painting, right? It's, it's going to be harder for me to improvise and to be a little more playful if I'm kind of having to, quote-unquote, paint within the lines, right? So, um, for some people, doing this kind of an outline is is like a... Whew, like it, it makes them a lot less anxious and they can actually breathe easier and paint um, in a more relaxed way versus doing for some people they may have actually found the previous method where I was just sort of eyeballing things to be like really liberating and like oh wow if there's if I throw out the the, the tracing and I just try to paint you know then you know I, I pretty much go in knowing that it's not going to be exactly the same so then I can I kind of feel like a weight's been lifted off my shoulders and I can kind of just kind of improvise a little bit and and be more playful okay I think that's all the I, I, I didn't do all the lines you could see I, I used a red pencil so you can kind of see what I've done and not only that it's also so that I can see what's been done and what hasn't been done right I didn't do that all that dark either because um, I uh, I don't want it to be you know if I do go outside of the lines I don't want to be trapped into I, I don't want those kind of those outlines to, to be really shouting like, hey, you didn't put it in the right place. So, anyway, that's that's my reasoning for doing that. Let's mix some paint. So we're, I'm just going to mix this uh, background color that we did on the very first step on the previous painting. So to do that... some warm yellow. You know what? I might even do this other painting as well while I'm right here. Alright, I mean, these paintings cost $2 each, 
so it's not like um, I'm blowing the bank. This is another reason why I've kind of grown to love these canvas boards is they're, you know, super cheap. They store very easily because they take up very little space. Um, I, you know, if given the choice, I, I prefer painting on canvas because I like the spring that you can, it's like a little bit of a trampoline. And actually find it's a little bit easier on the hand because it's like it's like walking on you know like a rubberized mat versus on concrete <laughs> you know like it's just a little bit uh, less hard on your on your hand if you're painting all day long having something that's a little bit more springy just it's just that just a little bit easier on your body right now, for many people, if you're just painting a couple of hours a week, you know, you probably won't see that kind of improvement. But, you know, as this is like my job, <laughs> you know, it can be a little exhausting if you're... Um, so having a bit of anything you can do to give your body a break is appreciated. I'm not even going to bother doing all the koi fish on there because I'm just going to paint them in there. So this just helps me kind of, you know, it's you could say like, well, what that such a simple drawing. What's the whole point of even doing that? Well, now I it's a, it certainly would is more accurate than if I was just trying to eyeball it. Okay. So let's mix up a batch of paint here. We're going to need a bunch of white. While we're at um, painting, what, 77, and this is now going to be my, I'm running out of my white paint, so I've, after about 80 paintings, I'll have needed two tubes of white paint. As for everything else, I still have probably enough to do in maybe another 10 paintings. So for, you know, again, in terms of investment of paint, yes, it cost me about 120 bucks for all of that paint. But I've got, what, eight months of painting and 70, 80 paintings by the end of it, out of it. Not a bad investment, right? Like, try, try getting into violin for, you know, 150 bucks, etc. Um, anyway. <laughs> um, oh, lots of stuff in the chat. Let me, I just want to mix this and I'm going to put the paint over and then I'll take a look at the comments. So let me get my paintbrush out here. So let's get some yellow. And some red. Mix up this orangey color. And so this is a warm red. Am I warm yellow? And let's get a bit of blue, and the blue is going to turn that orange into a brown. Okay, that's pretty good. So now I'm just going to take a bunch of white, we're going to scoop it in here.
And I probably could have put uh, less color into my white. Let me just... Actually, you know, it looks like I'm bang on to the last painting. Okay, so the other thing, too, is I'm going to take this water here, which looks kind of gross, and but it's deceptive. It's mostly just quite clear. I'm going to put a little bit more. I don't imagine it's going to affect my color much at all. People are always, when I'm, I've mentioned this you know, over and over and over again, but when I teach in person, there's some people that are always washing their paint. And really, if you're wiping your paint off onto a cloth before you put your paint brushes in your water, you, you barely, you shouldn't really ever have to wash your, your paint brush. Okay. So let me just organize this. Right, so the image will disappear for a couple of seconds, which I know causes some people instant anxiety. If it if worse came to worse, and you lost your image because you put too much, usually it's the white that's going to cover up. Just let it dry, and then use your template again and trace it on there again. That's why you don't ever want to spend too long doing these kind of this work on an early stage of the painting because sometimes it can be all for naught. So I've just learned to just, you got to roll with the punches a little bit and just uh, not get too hung up on things. I will say like, so for instance, this image has certainly disappeared a lot. Um, if I don't, if I really want to get a little bit of that back, I'm just going to get a clean cloth. And I'm just going to wipe the paint off of this brush. I'm not going to get any water on it. And then I'm just going to go back over and just wipe any extra paint off. And now I see the image kind of slowly reappearing there again. So it's just like I'm just taking the excess paint off. And I want to be careful that I'm not scrubbing. Okay, so this is very subtle. So this is going to be nice. It barely appears on camera, I think. But that's kind of good because you probably don't want people to see all of these lines. Not that the, you, it's, there's something about like immoral or, or hiding anything. Um... It's just that there's no... I don't think it's going to add necessarily anything that's going to that's going to make people appreciate it anymore if they can see those lines. Okay, so you can see... Here's the previous one. Ah, it is a lot more white. <laughs> ah, whatever. If I want to add more white, I can do that later on. I think maybe, let's say for this one, I'll add a little bit more white into the, my mixture. And again, let's get some water here. I'll show you what I did in a second. All right, put some white in there. Let's just mix it in good.
Okay. That's a little bit closer. Okay, cool. So that's this is the fish pond. That one went a little faster. So let's see if yikes, yikes, <laughs> this painting. If I can make it lighten it up even more. Just added a bunch more white into here. And then let's see if I can. Okay, so as expected, by putting that other layer on there, I lost my image. In this case, I don't want to scrape any of the paint off because then it's going to darken up again. But, uh, oh, and I was going to think about putting this on. Did I get all the edges? Just to go back to this painting. So to get this kind of uh, clean up the center here, I'm just gonna I'm just wiping to make sure I've this area of paint inside here is all dry. See, I smudged some of it just now, so that when this this could be a, a bit of a fool's errand here, but oh, let's do the same too this area. But it's always fun to, to play around like this and to... Oops! Just ruined my, my mixture by... I accidentally got a little bit of color in there that I didn't want. So let's get some white. I'll do that again. So I'll just put some white back in here. I'll mix it up with some of the existing color. Let's see. Now, you know, if I've if some of this looks a little bit sloppy like that, right? I can just let it dry and then I'll I'm going to paint some black lines back over top of of this. So 
Now, this is something that Wu Guangzhong would not have been able to do if he's painting on uh, paper. It's you can't really paint out your lines like this, not with watercolor or ink process. So here we're cheating a little bit, right? This is probably a big no-no. But <laughs> you know when we're when you're learning having the that little it's like your your parachute or something that you can you know fix a little things that you wish you had done. You know, in the Chinese painting tradition, you would just make another painting rather than, you know, you just like, oh, okay, oh, one didn't turn out the way I want. Okay, great. Well, let's just make another one. Now I'm going to let that dry. It does look a little bit white, more white. I suspect it's possible that it is more white. There might be more white that I put in there, but it's also usually colors when you put them on wet appear brighter. I think as it dries, it's going to look a little bit less in um, white than it does right now. So let's do this waterfall. <laughs> I painted over so much I'm trying to see where and which side is up I think. So I'm going to blow dry it, and then I'm going to actually just trace the image back again. You know, no big deal. So let's just take a look at the painting. You know, obviously, again, this my paper is... I should even think about the, the color of paper before I put this down. I, I'm sh totally happy with this. Um, but let's uh, think about how we could approach this here. Now, I've, I, it's probably almost invisible to you guys on camera, but my image has returned to a certain extent. It's not, it's not all uh, 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 reappeared, like this was obviously a little bit thicker paint, but I think you can see a bit of it there, right? Um, what? What's the, how should we approach this? Um... What I'm thinking about as I'm just sort of looking at this is um, uh, which steps I want to do first. Do I want to do the washes, this green wash and brown wash that are in the background on the mountains? Or do I want to do the line work first? Um, 
I would venture to say it it looks like he did all the line work first I think I think he did the, well maybe not all of them, but maybe a good portion of them I think he did the lines first and then afterwards did these because just because I'm looking I see this area here so I, th so I think he did all but the thing is is if I'm painting with the materials I have and I and um, on canvas uh, especially some paints that might take a little bit longer to dry. Um, anyway, um, let's do the lines first. Let's just pretend that we have the same materials as he is. So I'm just going to use I'm going to use the same black that I that I mixed earlier. Right, that was just my my um, black with pouring medium. Right, it's now kind of starting to get a little bit sticky. So, um, yeah, because it's been out for about two hours. So, you know what? Instead of doing that, let's. I'm just gonna mix a new black. And this time. I'm just going to use like a, a little lid. I have a I, <laughs> I save a bunch of these things like yogurt lids and that kind of stuff because I find them like really helpful for like a small palette. You don't necessarily always want a large palette, or sometimes you you use up all the space on your on your large palette. So let's. Um, I'm going to squeeze a little bit of black paint out here. And have a sip of tea. Uh, so Ling Li says, I think the painting uh, from Wu uh, is ink or watercolor. I, I'm sure, absolutely, you are right. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm positive he did not use acrylic. So... Uh, yeah, absolutely. He he was not using acrylic. I he um I'm sure he probably used some acrylic at some point um towards the end of his life, but m the vast majority of his paintings are on paper. Heidi says looking really good, Michael. What and a fun process. Uh Deborah says, "Wow, I never thought of painting like this as an exercise of letting go. It did, I did not want to do this painting, but now I see the purpose. I am far behind and just watching. Once I get caught up, I will do this and the house by the waterfall. Thank you, Michael. Okay. So I'm going to, let's, uh, to do this painting, I'm going to take some glazing fluid and I'm going to mix this together. So the glazing fluid is just going to thin it a little bit, make it a little bit more watery. And then I am also going to use actual water. And let me just, let's get a bigger brush just to dip some of this water. So I can, I'm starting to see my lines coming back here a little bit more. Um, if if you find that helpful. So again, I'm going to try to get you know do a little bit of the same sort of mark making process. I'm holding my my paintbrush a little bit further away. Um, if you want to get really close, you can do that. I'm just going to 
move a little bit further back so I can kind of get a little bit more of his type of process. Right, so that's that top mountain peak. And then we're going to come down here. And, you know, it, again, if you make any mistakes, you can go over the, the, the brush stroke again, a second, third, fourth time. Let's see, I'm looking for... These lines might be a little bit darker than his, but... We'll see, especially once we put some of that green wash over top. Like the these kind of wobbly lines that he's got in his painting are definitely a trademark of his style, and um, it's kind of fun to paint them. It's like. Uh, Especially if you're kind of doing it the way I am, kind of holding the brush a little bit further away. It is not easy. Like to, because when you're holding your hand over the canvas, you're trying to kind of keep the it the same distance. Because if you, if you go press harder, it's going to widen out. And if you press too light, it gets really thin or it comes right off the canvas. Not an easy thing to do. You know, as I'm doing this, the things that, the, the kind of thing that comes to mind, it reminds me a lot of like Tai Chi. Right of this, like, like really, uh, like you're focusing on these this you know, relatively simple movement of the body, but you're also being like hyper aware of what your body is doing as it's moving through space. And some people find that really uncomfortable to think about, right? And some people find that like really exciting to um, to kind of get in touch with their body. Oops, you can't see what I'm doing, can you? Um, let's see. Let's move. All right, so I'll just do a few more of these kind of. Oh, 
oh man, this is, <laughs> it's been, I haven't done this kind of thing in a long time. I used to actually do a lot of uh, very abstract paintings years ago. And I was exploring techniques like this. So I just wanted, I'm, the reason why I'm just showing this on the screen while I'm just painting is just so you see kind of how I'm painting. Like I kind of find where I want the paintbrush to start. Right, and you can see these brush strokes are not going in all the exact same places, right? But neither am I, like, super concerned of if they do or don't, right? Okay. Uh, I think what I'm going to do, I'm, I'm going to do the house, and maybe I'm going to come a little bit closer on my brush to do, some, actually I'm going to even go to a smaller brush to get some of these little bit finer details. And I might leave it like this. Uh, what I'd like to do is let this dry. And then I'm going to do the washes of that green over top of all of this. So I'm going to just let my, I'm going to clean my brushes off, put them in the water. And then I'm going to do the, the wash real quick. Some of this paint is still really wet, so I'm just going to soak up the big wet areas so that I can move forward. If I, um, if I was just doing this on my own, I would just, I wouldn't be in a particular hurry to do anything, so I would just let it go. But uh, uh, it's not really the case with the situation I'm in personally.
I just see in the chat just a couple of things here. Heidi says, I have an impression that for Chinese paintings, the black ink lines are put on first, unlike Western watercolor. Is that true? Um, and Wu also painted a lot of oil paintings. Um, yeah, interesting. Okay. Um, you know, it's hard to make any kind of universal... Um, pronouncements that like Chinese artists did one thing, Western artists did one thing, because not every artist, you know, follows the same path. In fact, most artists, uh, like myself, can be kind of annoyingly contrarian um, <laughs> and be like, oh, that's what everyone's doing? Okay, that's exactly what I'm not going to do, right? Uh, um, having said that, it is true that, um, you know, uh, Chinese, Japanese, Korean arts um, have a very powerful tradition, um, which is largely absent from Western art now, I, which I think is a great uh, misfortune. I think that's one of the. Uh, I mean, I think there's. I mean, there's pros and cons. I think there's there are reasons why Western artists want to break free of classical art. Um, uh, of classical Western art, um, and uh, but in in Chinese art, Japanese art, as I said, artists, you know, there's a very powerful tradition, and and there's a, you know, people artists see it as a great achievement to be able to paint in the style of a great artist like this, right? Um, that it's they wouldn't consider we don't have they don't have the same hang-ups that western artists do over uh kind of like copying or um you know traditionally in western art you would study for 20 years in another artist's studio you'd have a master painter like leonardo and you'd be in the school of leonardo and you'd be an assistant of his an apprentice and you'd be painting all the little details that he didn't want to paint, and then he'd come around, do a couple faces and hands and feet, sign it and, and sell it, right? That's tr and that's traditionally how Western art was up until, you know, about 1700 or so. Um, Chinese art was, was different in that you didn't really have artists paint, you know, apprentices painting on the master's paintings in the way that Western artists did. Um, but uh, there would definitely, you know, be painting alongside them, almost like in a classroom where you'd have like the master painting on their painting and you'd have like five to ten other uh, younger beginner artists um, you know, who could be, you know, in their 40s and 50s, like, when I say younger, you know, somebody, uh, like, Wu might have, like, in his 70s or 80s, might have people in their 40s and 50s learning from him, uh, who would be his, quote-unquote, apprentices, right, but they, they would be really trying to paint a you know, as closely to what he's painting as possible, to really understand his style, and in fact, there's photographs of, of, uh, artists like him, you know, painting, and you see like a crowd of, of, of students and, and journalists and stuff looking right over their shoulder, kind of watching like every brushstroke. In the same way, you're learning how to do calligraphy, and it's like repeating certain kinds of gestures and movements. Um, why am I talking about that? Uh, oh, because like, what would they have put down first, black lines or colors? Um, yeah, it's, it's hard to say because in Western art, there's Western artists who put black lines down first and then color. So it's, uh, but you, I think you are right. It's probably more black lines and then color. But I, I, it would be hard to say that there was more than, okay, anyway, blah, blah, blah. I could just talk forever. <laughs> As everybody watching is obviously knows, I get comments like this all the time on older videos like, Ah, it's 45 minutes in, and the guy still hasn't started painting yet. Yeah, I... Because the plan is, one day I'm going to edit all this down, and I'm just going to cut all my talking out. So if you get annoyed, you can just skip ahead to where you see the paintbrush moving on the canvas. Um, okay. 
So let's think about like how we how we're going to get this green, which is kind of a dirty green. And the way I would st it, it because it it's got a little bit of black, I would say in here. So and it, but it, we also want a cooler green that moves towards the background. Right? So let's let's take our cool yellow and warm blue. I'm mixing very little of it because we're not going to need too much of it. We're going to dilute this significantly. Um, I'm going to put a bit of glazing fluid in here. So the glazing fluid, it's like adding a little bit of adhesive or binding mechanism back into the paint as we dilute it. So it's still, it's like, um, it still has its adhesive properties, but it's a little bit thinner. Now, I'm just going to add a bit of water back in here. Really, this is the only time you've ever really seen me using water in the middle of a painting, at least for the past four months or five months or so, right? So I've got this watery paint. I'm just going to steal a little bit of this black that we used from before, mix it into my color here. That's going to dirty it up a little bit. Right? And that's what I often do. I just sort of just paint on the on the edge here and it gives me a little bit of a clear idea of what it looks like when it's not in the kind of the mass tone. Okay. And let's just uh let's just start painting here. Okay, and I look at that and I go, hmm, it's a little bit too bright. So let me see if I can wipe a bit of it off. Okay. So I'm going to add a bit more black. I'm going to add even more black here. Okay. So now this is getting kind of a dirtier color. And you know what? Actually, I'm also going to add a little... I'm going to take a bit of the cool red from the other side because what that's going to do is it's going to make it a bit more brownish there we go now I'm in the zone because I didn't like that emerald green quality of that paint here now we're that's much closer the thing is now it's 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 kind of it's uh, too saturated so it's going to wipe my brush off I'm just going to go in here where there's just a little bit of paint. Right? Now, you see that? Now we're much closer to the color. Okay. So again, I'm just going right back into here. I'm not scooping a bunch of this paint out. I'm just getting little bits of paint on my brush. And then we can put this wherever we feel it's required. And if we want to brighten that up, we can brighten it up, but I think I'm just going to continue painting with this. I'll put a layer of paint, and then if I want 
it looks a little bit bluer in a few places, so. And this right here, what I'm doing is that's a bit of a like a dry brush technique, which is very common in Asian art, right? It's just allowing the brush to get dry and applying um, the, the, literally the dry brush onto the canvas. Okay, so I got a little bit of that. I'm going to just add an ever so small little bit more of blue back into this. Just so I've got a little bit more variety of the, in terms of the color that I'm applying. I don't want it all just be the same color. So I just wipe that paintbrush off. Just sneak a bit more paint back on here. And then, you see just that little tiny subtle shifts of color. I'm getting a little heavy-handed up there, but uh, you know, that's the the trick of using, you know, uh, an additive process like this. Is you kind of have to take what you do and just move forward. Okay, so far, I think I'm going to get that. Okay. Um, and actually, you know what? I can. I'm going to use that same thing. I'm just going to take a bit. This is started to kind of dilute a bit, so take a bit more of this blue and just do the same thing. Mix it in. it off on my brush so I get that the, the, the big mass of, of tone that I had on there earlier and these are the bushes that are here this is my water line Um, I 
feeling good about that. So I think what I want to do now is let's get a bit of... Um, let's mix a, a brown. And I'm going to take this warm red from before. I'm just going to put this in here. So this is my warm... Uh, or sorry, this is my cool red. Sorry, my cool magenta red. I'm going to take some cool yellow as well and mix this into here. And just use this a color that's already here and mix that in. Oops, went a little bit too dark, so I'll just add a bit more of that yellow back into it. And I'm going to put a bit of... Oops, a little bit too much water. If you get a little too much water, just sort of tilt your palette to the side and let it kind of run run away, right? Okay, and then once again, I'm just gonna wipe my brush because or you could just use a different brush than you're than you're using for your mixing. Okay. Isn't it fun when the painting just starts to kind of slowly come into view? And you, I, obviously, I'm taking a few liberties here and putting some colors that weren't necessarily there. I'm just... Uh, I give myself permission to have fun, right? And to explore a little bit, as should you, right? So, I think while I'm right here and this paint is still a little bit wet, I am going to... This time I'm just going to cover um, using a little bit of tape a few things down here, these houses. Because I'm going to do a little bit of paint splattering here. So I'm just putting a bit of this tape. If I end up peeling some of this paint, or I won't peel off, but it might uh, take some of the, the paint I've just applied there. It might take a little bit uh, off, so that's why I'm... I'm but it, I, it's okay to do this at this stage of the process because if I peel it up, I'm still there's still work to be done down here. Okay, so in the same sort of way, remember we took. Let's see how. I'm just going to take some of this paint that we had in here. I'm going to do a bunch of splatters. Alrighty.
Okay. And now we can peel this tape off. This is what I should have done earlier when I did uh, the previous painting, but now I've kind of made sure that the bottom down here is relatively clean. That's going to take a little bit of time to dry, and then hopefully I will get a little bit of that same sort of effect that he did where the paint uh, kind of starts to pool and separate. If I don't get enough of that, I can always just take my brush and just dip and add you know, some splotches of paint. Especially to maybe some areas where it looks like the paint kind of bled on his canvas. Or paper, sorry, I mean. So now I'm just taking a bit of the black and dipping it into these darker areas and seeing if that will cause some blending. So we'll see. This, you know, it'll it just certainly, as I said, um, Wu had a great way of controlling the, the these aspects of the painting, which is one of the reasons why he's a master, right? Is that he was able to kind of it's like taming a wild horse or something. So I'm putting all of this water in, especially these areas where paintbrush, where brush strokes seem to connect to try to get that, that blurring quality. Okay. And let's do a little bit of that, I, that same um, red. So we have this magenta. Let's put a bit of that in here and we'll see if it mixes into some things. Okay. Um Yeah, let's uh Maybe I'll, I'm going to do that with some blue. I'll show you here in a second. So I just have this blue just right out of the tube, my cool blue. These aren't going in any sp like specific. I mean, they're, I'm looking at the original, but I'm not being like obsessed with trying to make it perfect, right? Okay. So let's continue down on the in this area. What should we do next? I think we'll, let's do the darker splotches. So these darker areas, remember we've got you know this black that we had. I'm going to take a bunch of this black and just put it on my brush and go back to this watery mess that we have down here and put this black in here and then mix it in with Remember, I got a little bit too much water in there before. So we're going to use that. Just 
squeeze that off. I'm actually just gonna quickly clean the brush. Again, you could use a different brush. I always find it, I don't know, just me personally, I like using the same brush, two or three brushes throughout a single painting. Um, okay. So I'm just eyeballing this stuff right here. I mean, I have my these the lines I put down there kind of help guide me and put me into the into the zone, the area that I want to be in, but then here's the the shore here. sort of thing here. I'm not sure what is, but it's almost like a boat. Is that what that is? It's an interesting shape he's got here. I'm not sure. I'm sure what. Anyway. Again, if you, depending on how much water you put in here, it could be. You know, it might go on kind of dark, but as it dries, it's going to change, right? So. Next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to put some uh, blue, cool blue, in the water. So I'm going to take a bit of this kind of dirty color we had here. I'm going to put it down here, get a bit of this blue in. Looks pretty close. So again, I'm just gonna wipe my brush off, and then let's So I might actually brighten this up a little bit. I'll wait for it to dry before I do that. Um, I'm also going to just put a little bit of that same color 
It looks like things are still actually pretty... You know what I should do is... is well, it's going to blow dry some stuff, but I think... Before I get there... little dots. Oh, and there's a line here it's missing, so let's just paint that in right now. So these are, are, are not as dark as I want them to be. That's totally it's what I want, right, at this point. Um, and then let's get some oh, kind of a warmish yellow. So a warmish brown. We're doing a lot of uh, cooler colors. We want a little bit, some warm it up and so we get closer to the foreground here. So going to mix um, this warmish orange. I think even just, oh, I see a little bit of the blue in my paintbrush. Makes it go nice and brown. Actually, to do this, <coughs> do I have a... Okay. So I'm going to use... Oh, I do have a flat... It's a little bit big. Okay. So I'm going to use a flat brush like this. Uh, I don't know if you can see. All right. And then I'm going to use it in the paint like this. All right, so I'm just sort of like stamping down here to get these these trees that kind of grow in like la layers like that. Take a bit of white, mix this in to make it stand out a bit. A bit of white. So I'm just putting this color down, not that this is the final color, but it's going to help me put a brighter color, a more saturated color over top afterwards. Okay. <laughs> Heidi says, yes, totally different experience from Kusam. <laughs> it's 
totally different, right? Some people, they might love this, and some people are just like, whoa, I need a little bit more organization in my life. <laughs> and that's what's fun. I love, I love, you know, experimenting with different styles and learning about all these different artists and um, just exploring, really. Okay, so uh, let's blow dry this and see if I can get in here and start putting some branches on these trees. Okay, I'm taking the a small brush and some black. And we'll come in and just start kind of putting some a little bit finer detail in this painting. Now you could have done the, some of this a little bit earlier. I don't have a green thumb in my body, so I um, don't really know the differences in different trees and the way that they, the branches grow. I just usually do stoop by observation. And it's a little unclear. Maybe let's just zoom in.
And some of these lines are getting a little bit wide on my side. Which could be cause for some frustration for some people, but... Let them worry about it. I wonder if those are steps leading up to... Let's put another door here. Getting closer and closer on this one. Now mine's a l obviously a little bit darker just because of the canvas I painted on was a little bit darker to begin with. Um, so I might go in here and just brighten some things up a little bit, a little bit brighter colors. I guess there's more lines that I could put down on here. the way that was applied, so...
kind of putting this kind of peachy color down, and then I'm going to see if I can paint the warm yellow over top of some of this, just because it's against a pretty dark area. So I'm kind of, almost kind of like whiting things out a little bit. So let's get this green down here in. So this is cool blue and cool yellow and white. white in there. He's got a bunch of these little spots all over here. So I just put the, I don't know if that's coming across, but I just put the paint down and then just taking my finger and just pulling a bit of the paint. Wow, as I look in here, there's so much like, like bright little pops of color in and around here. Like this is, I mean, it's gorgeous stuff. Not easy to, to pull off. Holy smokes! Okay, I'm just going to take some white and, and warm yellow and do a similar kind of thing. Oops. Here. Again, I'm, I'm going a little bit off script just because my colors in and around here are much darker than his. So I'm just trying to brighten up some of these leaves and things that were there. He's got a little bits of this just yellow out of the tube in a few places. Oh 
Okay. Um. <laughs> So just little bits of color here and there. And then we'll Oh, and the fish. I totally forgot about the fish. Oh my goodness. Wow, those little fish make a big difference. Holy smokes, I didn't even... Th that makes a huge difference. All of a sudden, the painting kind of comes together in a way that... I did not expect. Huh. Who would have known? Who would have thought? What a simple little thing. These little tiny... Dots all of a sudden just hmm. okay. So let's if we zoom all the way back out over right here and Magenta back in here. Um, a few of you used, you know, put the actual stamp or their version of the stamp or attempted to do it. Um, I'm, I'm not going to put the stamp in there just because, just both out of time and, um, because I, I, I'm sitting here debating. I think I am going to take a stab at the other painting here. The third, well, actually, let's, okay, so this, I'm going to set aside for a little bit and let it dry and then take a fresh look at it in about 10 minutes and just see how I feel about it. And while that's happening, I'm gonna come back here and think about 
this. going over some of these blops that were there. This is not a good big deal, but it's just sort of one of those things where, huh, you know, I can um, hide them or deal with them, and this is that overspray, little splatters that maybe I was a little overzealous in that area. And then I'm going to put black back over top of it after that dries. Actually, maybe let's just I'm going to blow dry it and then do another layer. I see in the chat um, people talking about going on a painting trip to China. Paul says, in China, these stone hill mountains are very common. You can check. Deborah says, on my bucket list to visit China. Uh, and Paul says, Michael's painting team can do plein air there. <laughs> yeah, that would be awesome if we all went down there together once the world returns to normal. That would be the coolest thing in the world. Sign me up. There's some great museums there, too. And as I said, like, things are, are changing pretty quickly. There's a lot more collecting of, of these great Chinese artists. And so the opportunity to, you know, because, I, you know, for decades, Chinese collectors and museums were us buying up all the Van Goghs and Matisse's and Picasso's um, rather than focusing on buying up all the great artists that were homegrown talent. And like I said, that's the same sort of problem that, that is still very common here in Canada. People have well, are more likely to buy American artist or British artist than they are to buy like museums than to, to buy Canadian artists. So don't get me started on that one. <laughs> okay. So I'm gonna let that dry. And dare I I know that most where did I put that? There's a lot of you that are will probably sign off very soon, but just for the sake of finishing what I started here, let's see if I can do this in a relative period of time here. Um, so, to do this, let's get... some water on this palette. And here, I'll just move this out of the way. This is my black paint. We're gonna make like a gray. I am gonna add a little bit of white in here. Okay. 
Okay. I like how it's kind of starting to already dilute a little bit. Like it's kind of separating. This is a kind of a fun one to paint, actually. Just making these little circles. <laughs> so these are, like, I can, if I let this dry, I can paint the same lines over top, and it'll make the ones underneath a little bit darker. Now, time-wise, I'm not sure if I'll have the time to do that. Obviously, it's, it looks much different than his, but uh, at this stage, anyway. See, I'm using a, a, a bit of a, a larger brush than is maybe required. I think when you use like a bit of a bigger brush, it sort of forces you to to work um, that you can't really get bogged down in the details. You have to kind of just go a little bit bigger because I mean you have no choice, right? Your brush. When you use a big brush, you have to. You just can't do a little detail. So. It's kind of nice to be sort of forced. Sometimes you have to force yourself into that position. Okay, so maybe while all this is still pretty wet, I'm going to get some... Do the greens now. So we'll take this cool blue. Actually, uh, I'm going to put some water in there right now. Here, so we can match some of the color a little bit. Just steal a little bit of that black again.
So that's one green. The other one is going to be a bit of a warmer green. So we haven't even used really the warm blue much today. So we're going to take this warm blue, warm yellow, get my stir. get some water here. Clean the brush off. I need more water there. So this kind of looks a little bit muddy and dirty, and it, and it kind of is right now. As it dries, we'll, we'll let uh, it kind of take its course and see what happens, and then we can adjust from there. Um, and there's this black line. Yeah, let's do a little bit of painting in there while it's wet and see what it does. That's what he did, right? Some little dots and stuff in here. Okay. I think some of those other green lines are going to take a little bit of time for. Uh, I'll have to wait for it to dry a little bit before I can get to that. So let's paint some koi fish.
takes kind of a second to get the technique down here. He's kind of pressing down and then just pulling away. I'm not worrying too much about getting fish in the right place and the right size and all that kind of stuff. Like all these little fish underneath there. I'm gonna get there in a second. I just gotta. I guess I'm gonna have to rotate the canvas to get there. So let's do that. So it's tricky to do when you when your hand is hovering over the canvas. This is a, a this is a fun painting. If I had thought about it, this would be the probably the one <laughs> we would have focused on today. I just didn't. Uh, I mean, obviously, I liked it enough to include it, but I didn't think it was going to be um, this much fun to paint. Hmm. Oh, 
opposite direction. So it seems to, like, starting with the tail and working my way to the front is kind of what's feels um, most kind of natural to, to my body. little fishes kind of off in the background here. Hmm. Okay. I think I'm going to let this sit for a few minutes. And just kind of come back to uh, look at the other paintings. Let's see if there's anything. Okay, so I want to finish this off. That shouldn't be too much more involved here. Just to kind of come back and get some of these brush strokes, which um, I painted over when I was tidying up the picture. Let's go back to the actual painting, right? Um, just as I see a bunch of things in the... Uh, Heidi says, I feel I need to feed the cat and the humans today. Very engaging session, though, and I'm not close to finishing anything. Thank you, Michael. Good night, everyone. Deborah says, good night, Heidi. Good night, Heidi. Thank you so much for joining me and us. Thank you. Where did that little drop come from? Oh, it's a little, little speck of something. Okay, I feel like that helps things a lot, that uh, just clarifying the center. Of the painting. I think, you know, the the center of the, the wall, I think, needed to have that. Um, we need these little birds flying in the sky. So...
Feels good. Okay. Let me see. Any little other little buildings? Mountains. He does have tons of these little wispy lines in here. So I'm going to add it some more. These little lines you put in here, hopefully the better. all of these lines I think it just helps actually in some ways the, all of those busy lines help clarify the center of the painting strangely enough right we have this the more lines that are surrounding it the more it makes the empty space in the in center it draws our attention more to that that place without it it sort of just feels kind of a little bit uh, uh, all over, like there's just too much going on. So it's kind of ironic that adding more stuff actually helps clarify the picture, right? More lines going all sorts of different ways because it makes it so much different than the empty space in the center. I'm so interested to see what paintings people make out of all this today.
Okay, am I pretty close? Putting a couple of little, these like black dots around here. See, that's kind of a something that I don't really have much of. Lots of lines, not lots of dots. <clears throat> I got little splatters, but I, some of these are not splatters. These are things that he's done deliberately with a paintbrush and And you know, this painting, considering this was just eyeballed, right? I just took my brush and started painting um, as best as, with my best judgment as to where things should go. It's, you know, not perfect, but uh, nowhere near perfect. But, yeah, you know, it's, I think I got the the basics of everything in place here. Our daughter's going to be up late tonight. Did not go for... Uh, well, maybe she'll go to sleep early. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> You're a lot of energy running around up there. Okay. I think that's uh, probably... More than enough. Okay. Um, there's still a lot of wet paint on there, so I'm not going to turn it over to sign it, and I'll just let that dry overnight before I do any more work to it. Um, Deborah says, I must follow Heidi and say goodnight, everyone. See you on Tuesday. Good night, Deborah. Thank you again, Michael, for a great class. Thank you. It's great to. How about you guys join me, especially if we've been painting for a while here. We've done a bunch of different paintings. So um, this one, uh, let's see. Is there anything else that can be done here? Uh, you know what? I think I'm pretty happy with it. Obviously, I think the the main thing that if I was to do this one again would be to have a bit brighter, you know, a white color. Uh, it's a little bit on the darker side, and that and then I also painted 
darker colors where some of these trees would be. So probably if I was to do it again, I might do a little bit more of these details, paint some of these, and that way that I could leave space around so I wouldn't have to try to worry about brightening up these leaves on the trees. But all in all, I think it's all there. Uh, oh, you know what? I just noticed little trees on the top of the hills up here. Maybe just I'm gonna put a few branches that got kind of hidden. Just bring some of that detail back. I think that helped big time. It's funny how just a f sometimes a little bit of black lines or dark colors. It can, well, same thing also with like with uh, some highlights can just like radically elevate a painting that is sort of a little bit muddy, just to give a little bit of clarity, help draw. Our attention to certain places or away from other places. I'm going to put little spots and things on these trees. They're not really there, but it does have like little splatters, but it does sort of, in my mind, at least I'm thinking that it could just add a little pop of detail to some of these areas. Oh. Okay. Um, that one I think is also good. So our final one here, and I'll bring them all out so we can see them side by side in a moment. Let's see.
brush to do this. So this color that I'm using here is um, warm yellow and warm blue. Uh, it's not exactly the same color. I'm just, but it's also my colors aren't exactly the same as the ones that he's using, and it's all a little bit wet, so... that I'm gonna have to come back and touch that up so the next thing I want to do is these blobs of Oh, how did I get this big blob of black right there? Huh. That is funny. So let's just see. Um, managed to soak it up. Not that it, it would have been the end of the world had I stayed there, but, um, and if I was really disappointed, I could paint, maybe I'll paint a koi fish right over top of it in a second. Um, let's just do that.
some of these fish I'm just gonna darken a little bit they've some of the color kind of pooled away so I think they look a little bit better a little bit more full with volume so or at least some of them do we don't need to do all of them but You know, I could be... Let's... I kind of want to blow dry this just to see if there's anything else I want to do before we call it a night. I'm gonna put I like some of these shapes. I'm gonna put these back in here. Oh, I don't want to stop. I, I really am I'm, I'm enjoying this one a lot, actually.
So, you know, I was going to put some darker gray back here over top of all of this, but I gotta say, I, I kind of like it like this. It's not the same, but I don't know. Um, yeah, it's just sometimes you just get to a point where you're like, you know what, I don't know. I don't know if 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 I do any more, I could be causing irreparable damage to the painting. So, um... Let's see. There's our paintings for today. It's a little hard to see them with a dirty background. Um, wow. I would... S it's hard to say which one... I, I would... S I think this one turned out is my least favorite of the three that I've done. So it's between these two. This one took me maybe 30 minutes to paint. Um... It was obviously the last one I did. I don't know. I might... I think it's between, obviously, these two is which one I like the most. I think... I... I think I like this one the most. I think I like the, the one that, I, that took me the least amount of time to do the most. And it's not surprising... That, that might happen. Sometimes, you know, it takes a while to get warmed up and to really get going. And, um, you know, once I finally found my footing, I started to really understand his process, I feel like it came more naturally to me. Whereas, I, th I mean, I think the, 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 the house with the waterfall... Um, I liked uh, earlier on in this painting, I think it was working really well. And I think I just maybe overdid it a little bit. It just got a little bit too dark. The background being a little bit darker, I didn't, I don't think helped. Um, but all in all, it was, this has been really interesting. Um, okay, I think I gotta, I gotta call it night. So... Um, let me see. So, thank you everyone for joining me for another painting session, for painting along with me so that we could uh, recreate this master's paintings again. Um, Wu Guangzhong uh, was, uh, you know, I, I didn't even really talk really about his biography too much. Um, I mentioned that really we don't have very many of his earlier paintings because he was forced to destroy them. He and or the authorities destroyed most of his early work and sent him to a re-education camp, as they called it in China at the time, um, because they saw his sort of incorporation of some Western um, influences as being a corrupting influence and that he was abandoning more traditional Chinese ways of painting, which in retrospect is... I mean, I, I can see some of that Western influence, but, I mean, uh, I don't think there's any doubt that he's coming from a Chinese tradition. So uh, that was one of the really unfortunate things that happened to him. And we're going to see our artist on Tuesday... Talk about a tragic life. Um, our, the artist on Tuesday we're going to talk about was uh, Wu Guangzong's teacher. And that guy took the full force, the brunt punishment uh, that the authorities could level against him. Um, and he was sort of 
caught in between both the Chinese authorities and the Japanese uh, invaders who took over China during World War II. And uh, anyway, that's a story for uh, Tuesday's episode. But um, I think considering the, the difficulties had that he had with um, uh, some of the authorities during the 60s, once, um, once Mao died in 76, I think, um, all of a sudden we had a lot more uh, freedom to, to paint in his style, of which these are paintings um, from the 70s and 80s. And um, uh, he had an explosion of creativity afterwards. And really, you know, uh, achieved kind of international fame. People knew who he was, but uh, he just wasn't really allowed to express himself to his full extent. And um, so that's a, it's a shame, but considering all the difficulty he went through, again, if you watch any of the videos and interviews with him, you'd be surprised at how kind of positive and jovial of a character he is. He seems like a really fun guy to be around. So um, if you like today's episode, like and subscribe, hit the notification bell so you can see when the next videos are coming up. I'm going to be doing a number of surprise um, sessions over the next month. So you'll want to kind of be uh, tuned in for that. Uh, if you want to support the channel with a small donation, there's a link to the PayPal below, and I would be very appreciative for any support. Everything you see around me is um, uh, was purchased through assistance of the generous viewers and uh, artists such as yourself. So if you want to... Um, uh, give any assist like that or even just share this as a link to your friends and family post your picture and just put a little link there showing the video that inspired your painting and that might inspire a couple of friends of yours to take up painting and wouldn't it be great if more people were painting okay everyone thank you so much we will see you in a couple of days have a great weekend and, um, yeah, I don't know if anything else I got to say, so we'll leave it there. Uh, t let me see. That looks pretty good. Pretty happy with that, right? Okay, everybody. Have a good evening, and we will see you on the flip side.